All right, health psych students, this is part two of the cancer lecture, the last lecture of the semester. Oh my goodness, it's so weird to be doing this in March. What weird times we are in. All right, I'm going to pull up your PowerPoint here and we are going to pick back up where we left off with the screening guidelines. Um, oh, my funny story from my friend uh, who works for the VA. She was <laughs> about to examine this uh, guy that had uh, prostate cancer and he had so many people do this digital rectal exam and uh, she says that you know she she gloves she lubes this kind of stuff has him bend over and goes in to check his prostate and she said he, he said um, he said like oh small fingers <laughs> so apparently he'd had some big fingers um, up there checking on his prostate so um, all right let's talk a little bit about colon and rectal uh, cancer screening. Um, ideally right now, they're recommending for anybody in the United States over the age of 50, unless you've got a family history that is high risk um, for colon cancer, that people start the, the colonoscopy at age 50. Where this has become controversial is that all of us could endure a colonoscopy where they thread up through rectum all the way through intestines after you have totally cleansed. So you have to drink this solution or take these pills and then, and then you got to starve yourself and it totally cleans out your GI tract so they can go in there and actually see the, the walls of the intestines and the rectum, all the kind of stuff, um, and not necessarily be dealing with um, feces that's left over there. But most people prefer to be knocked out and put under. And so now it has become the screening procedure that's, that has amounted to this surgical procedure. And there's some controversy about that, that should individuals be going into hospitals and having a surgical um, screening or only certain people really at risk. Um, nowadays, they have developed some screeners for colon cancer where people can, um, with a certain kit, donate their feces. So use a kit, put their feces in, treat it, send it off to a lab and where they check um, within the feces, are there any um, cells that have been expelled that are possibly uh, cancerous? Um, as well as screening for um, oral cancer, most dentists nowadays will check very carefully in the mouth. Um, skin cancer, uh, most primary care doctors will do skin cancer screens. If anybody's particularly at high risk for that, like I'm a, I'm a person that's at high risk, I told you about being a little brown baby. Um, I um, go see a dermatologist, so a skin specialist, a dermatologist on a regular basis for that type of screening. But this is where we've made our headway, people. It is being able to do these screens, catching cancer early, um, being able to treat it. Know that the American Cancer Society, um, you can look this up online, it has guidelines for uh, the screens that we do for men, for women, children, teens, adults, all throughout the life. I'm not going to expect you to memorize all that kind of stuff, but just know that that, that stuff is out there. Breast cancer is um, second most common in women after lung cancer. Um, and depending on if we look at all women of all ages, uh, all women have a risk of one in 10, but after women reach menopause, our risk um, becomes higher and our risk becomes one in eight. Um, survival is 100% if it's detected in the original tumor. And I've got a picture here. This is horrible, horrible, untreated breast cancer here. Um, and it's filled up her entire breast. Um, most survival is hundred percent if we catch it in the original tumor, which is again, why ideally women and even men are doing that self breast exam. Um, we have seen survival five year survival is up uh, 90% after the 1990s. And what was going, we had this interesting generational effect that was happening where this would be, um, my mother and grandmother's generation, probably your great or great grandmother's generation, where women, when they were hitting menopause around their 50s, if they were symptomatic and complaining to their healthcare provider, all of them got put on hormone replacement therapy. But even in some cases, if the women weren't complaining of symptoms, they weren't complaining of hot flashes, they weren't complaining of, um, 
dryness and that type of thing. Uh, even women who weren't complaining, a lot of the doctors were just putting women on these hormone replacements, um, just thinking it was the right thing to do. And thank goodness we had epidemiological and randomized clinical trials. We had research that was um, tracking this because what was happening is it was driving up breast cancer rates in these women, these menopausal women on this um, hormone replacement therapy, driving up cancer rates and in some cases even um, creating more um, heart disease and lung cancer death. So thank goodness we were studying it to realize that we needed to stop doing that. That So nowadays it's practitioners only if women are really suffering and really complaining about their suffering or they put on hormone replacement therapy. They are usually put on very teeny tiny doses um, from the start to see what kind of doses relieve their symptoms. Um, and then most doctors will try to get women on that stuff and off of that stuff as soon as they can. There are also a lot of um, doctors recommending and women taking plant-based phytoestrogens um, where you can find these over the counter. You don't even need prescriptions for them. Um, and so it's, it's concentrated phytoestrogens from plants um, and some women are finding relief from that. We know that risk factors um, for breast cancer over 50, like I talked about, again, it's one in 10 for all women, one in eight after 50. Women who started their menstrual periods earlier and women who hit menopause later, who have longer period of their lifespan where they are exposed to their own normal hormones, they're gonna be more at risk than women who started their periods later, women who hit menopause earlier. If there is a history of using any of those um, hormone replacement therapies, um, that estrogen, particularly estrogen and progesterone combination, um, that's a risk factor. People who carry the BRCA genes, um, and those are usually individuals who have not only a family history, but a family history of hearing about particularly women being diagnosed with breast cancer or ovarian cancer early in life, so in their 30s, their 40s. Um, and I really feel for these um, individuals because once you test positive for the gene, You've got to decide, are you just going to be asked to be monitored very carefully um, by a healthcare professional? Or some of these women even decide to go and get full mastectomy, so to have their entire breast removed, um, and then if they can afford it or insurance covers it, reconstruction surgery. Um, Angelina Jolie was uh, an example of a woman who decided, actress, um, who decided to, because of her genetic history and her mother's very early death from breast cancer decided to get double mastectomy decided to get ovaries and uterus removed to protect her from ovarian and uterine cancer um, and those types of cancers are, are obviously going to send when these younger women into very abrupt menopause and menopause is meant to be um, more this progression and not this abrupt type of event and then there are even issues with genetic testing of if you test positive for one of these genes, are you now at high risk? And in the old days, insurance companies could dump you if you were um, had a pre-existing condition. And remember, it's the Affordable Care Patient Protection Act, Obamacare, that removed the ability of insurance companies um, to disallow people to join and buy their exchanges um, if they had pre-existings. Um, and then there are other kinds of issues in like, let's say I know my family's at high risk and I choose to be tested and I know my test results. And let's say my sister doesn't want to know. It'd be too anxiety provoking for her to know. She goes and gets her health care. Um, or your daughters, you know, what if daughters or even sons can be carriers, men can be carriers and um, women are more likely to evidence the cancer from it but just all of those kinds of issues about decision-making. My former master's student, um, Dr. Christy Graves, um, is now at Georgetown University. She was at Lombard, Lombardi Cancer Center. She studies and has crossed over. She studied clinical health psychology. She studied genetics, medicine, all kinds of different things. And she mainly studies decision-making and how to help um, cancer patients understand their own individual risks in language that they can understand, laying out options for them, 
so that they make the best possible dis personal decisions for themselves um, medically in their treatment. We know that it's a risk factor um, to be childless as a woman or have children after the age of 30. It's not a reason to go, you know, run out there and make a baby, but it's a known risk. Um, and women who consume a lot of animal products um, and particularly high fat diet are gonna be more at risk. Women who have a body mass index that falls in the obese range are gonna have a higher risk of breast cancer than women who are in more of a normal weight range. But even those known risk factors um, only account for about 15% of the variance. So there's just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknown risk of what causes these cancers, which again is why ideally all of us are getting our healthcare professional checks. All of us are doing our self breast exams. We know that protective factors, um, uh, having babies before 30 and breastfeeding, getting regular exercise, having a healthy body weight, um, really healthful nutrition is going to be protective, that rainbow diet thing again. Uh, cancer, breast cancer rates have remained um, really quite stable um, across the last 100 plus years. Um, and so I just want us to note that because every now and then again, uh, it's a myth. If you ask lay people what the number one leading cause of death is from women, it's really heart attacks, myocardial infarctions, but most people will say breast cancer. And the reason for that is the fear associated with breast cancer. And then every now and then the media decides to try to scare us. They'll come out with some new risk, um, like using antiperspirant de deodorants or having your clothes dry cleaned or things like that, um, that, that easily make the news and make a story because it plays on women's fear. So treatment for cancer, um, we have quite a few survivors out there nowadays. 90% um, of cancer patients, if they can detect that tumor in the original organ and they can get to that tumor, and in most places in the body, they can get to those tumors unless you've got certain areas deep in the brain that are too risky to get to, um, surgically getting in there and removing tumors. And then um, either offering, depending on the stage of the cancer and then how young or old is this particular person who is going through the cancer. Chemotherapy, anytime we take a medication. So I take in the mornings Allegra for allergies as an example. Technically I am on chemotherapy for my allergies, but the term has become so associated with cancer treatment medications or, or IVs, that type of thing that we've learned to call chemo and associate it with cancer treatment. Ideally what the chemo does is it gets in there and it poisons cancer cells and kills cancer cells. But unfortunately what a lot of chemo also does is it gets in there and it kills healthy cells. And one way of thinking about there's different chemos designed to target different cancers and to kill those cells in different ways. So some of the chemos uh, kill rapidly reproducing cells. And if we think through a lot of the side effects for chemo, um, it, it's going to make a lot of sense of why we have those side effects, because the side effects are experienced in our rapidly um, replicating cells much more so than our slowly replicating cells. So I want to think, I want us to think about our rapidly growing cells and what are some symptoms of people on chemo. Hair. Hair is rapidly growing, um, rapid replication. And so it makes a lot of sense why hair follicles stop producing. If you're slowing down all fast replicating cells, then uh, the hair stops growing out of the follicle and so it tends to fall out for a lot of chemo patients. We have very rapidly replicating cells in our um, mouths, in our entire gastrointestinal system. So it makes a lot of sense of why you hear people with about the nausea and the vomiting that is occurring in chemo patients. You also, you may not be hearing about it, but it's happening for a lot of individuals um, getting um, pretty intense diarrhea um, while they're on chemo. And so if you think about those fast replicating cells, same kinds of things for women and their, um, their vulva and their vaginas, they oftentimes get a lot of um, opportunistic yeast infections um, because those are very rapidly producing cells that can withstand the friction that occurs both during um, intercourse as well as the shedding of linings when women shed their, their menstrual period. Um, so again, that stuff's happening. We tend not to hear about it so much. Um, 
but again, it makes sense. Some other chemotherapies um, rob cancer cells of glucose. There are a lot of people out there. We mentioned briefly the ketogenic diet back in nutrition. There are a lot of individuals out there that have uh, diagnosable cancers that feed off of glucose. And so uh, those individuals are going on keto, very low carb, higher protein, higher um, fat to attempt to starve their cancer cells. And that um, there's even some interesting scientific literature to show that that is effective for certain kinds of cancers. Um, there are others that try to block um, blood flow. There's just a variety of different ways of trying to get at those bad cells without necessarily getting at the good cells and killing the good cells. Radiation therapy, um, if you had and you survived in high school or in college trigonometry, if you remember trigonometry was all about the math of waves and that is very relevant for uh, engineers who study waves and for um, radiation uh, scientific th therapies, developing them. Um, and so depending on how deep, how far into the body the tumor area is, if they can get that original tumor out, they usually do. Sometimes they will radiate the cells around the tumor just in case any of those little boogers snuck off into nearby cells. And the challenge there with radiation therapy is you've got to go through oftentimes healthy cells um, to get to those cancerous cells. So the cells on root, those healthy cells on root and healthy cells in that surrounding tissue are going to be burned. And that's what cancer patients who are on radiation therapy say that it feels like. I had a client years ago um, refer to me because she was not necessarily motivated at preserving her pelvic area because um, she wasn't necessarily um, interested in ever uh, being with man again after this really horrible, horrible relationship and divorce that she went through. And she was suffering from colon cancer. And they were um, providing her with radiation therapy up through her rectum that was creating burning and damaged cells all throughout her pelvic area. And she talked about the feeling, the sensation that she had in her pelvis, this poor woman, was that like she had this severe sunburn everywhere inside her abdomen, inside her pelvis. Um, and eventually... Uh, we were able to get her um, working back with her physical therapist and doing some therapies at home um, to preserve her, her vagina and her sexual functioning. Um, alternative treatments. There's some real simple psychology here. You know, I want you to absorb this. Cancer, having cancer, all the uncertainty waiting for diagnoses and treatments and the effectiveness of treatments, cancer creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. Cancer in and of itself is punishing. Cancer treatment for a lot of individuals, think about going through surgeries to have tumors removed, think about going through radiation and feeling that burn, thinking about going through chemotherapy and having those side effects, the weight loss, the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea. Cancer treatment is punishing. So cancer is punishing, cancer treatment is punishing. It makes a lot of sense that a lot of people would reach out for alternative therapies. And we do have some really good complementary therapies like changing diet, exercising on a regular basis, managing stress, utilizing social support, all of that kind of stuff. All of the stuff that we know that bolsters the immune system is going to be spot on and should be recommended for every single cancer patient out there. Where people get a little, where things get a little weird is when people start reaching for these therapies um, that do not have any scientific evidence that are in a lot of cases just plain old placebos, which again, the belief that it could be helpful oftentimes has an, a positive effect for people. But sometimes, unfortunately, people are spending ridiculous amounts of money on these alternative things where we don't have any scientific evidence. Um, that may or may not be operating well for them as a placebo or just plain waste of um, resources or, or waste of hope. So the biopsychosocial, and then I would really add to this one, spiritual, because boy, I can tell you whether you are a spiritual or religious person, getting diagnosis of cancer at least is going to bring up questions of why me? Like why me, why now, what does this mean? People who are spiritual have beliefs in God are oftentimes, you know, 
Um, is, is, am I being punished? Is God punishing me or is God testing me seeing, you know, how strong I am, that kind of thing. Psychologists get pulled in because people are needing help with their pain from their cancer, their fear, um, their disability, um, their disfigurement. There's a lot of research, particularly for um, women who've had mastectomies, either single or double mastectomies, and what that disfigurement does for them from a body image standpoint, um, what that disfigurement does for them as sexual beings and, and loss of sexual sensation um, from, from breasts or if they've had, um, uh, uterine, if their uterus and their ovaries removed and sent into abrupt menopause, financial stress. Um, I, I find it sad when you're in these stores and they have those little, um, you know, drop coins or drop money in where people are raising money for like a bone marrow transplant or cancer treatment because they don't have insurance. Um, those are just oftentimes very sad cases. So psychologists get brought in for a lot of different reasons. Um, uh, like I told you, Dr. Christy Graves, my former student, um, helping people get the information that they need to make those choices and those decisions about their medical treatment. I'm going to show you a documentary um, at the end of this lecture. And one of the things I want you paying attention to are some of these women talking about these difficult decisions or talking about what to do when they know they have metastatic breast cancer. So all the women that are gonna be featured in, the, in these support groups are women who've had breast cancer, it's been treated, but now the breast cancer has metastasized and shown back up. And you'll hear these women talk about even this one woman having a recurrence in her neck. And she's like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect this. What am I, you know, what am I going to do when I've, when I've gone through my, my chemo, my radiation, and now I've got another case showing back somewhere else in my body. Helping clients cope with aversive procedures. There's even some things that can be done to help patients um, manage and reduce their nausea and their vomiting and their, um, their diarrhea, that type of thing. Um, and helping people uh, just cope with the disease. So engaging, ideally changing and engaging in healthy lifestyle behaviors that's going to help their immune system helping them cope with the uncertainty of the disease. Um, in, a, in some situations, helping uh, patients cope with the terminal illness so that knowing that they are dying um, from disease. I had a former client who died of cancer. And uh, one of the things that he had me do, first of all, his family, he knew he was terminal. He knew that he was dying, but his family were kind of in this denial. They didn't quite they weren't quite absorbing the fact that that this was going to take his life. And um, I was seeing him individually, but over time he asked me to bring his entire family in for therapy because uh, for a couple of reasons, he had an agenda and he needed his family in there as an audience to hear his agenda. And he used me as a support system. Um, first of all, he wanted them to realize that he was dying, that he had some things he needed closure with in relationships and he needed to make amends. Um, he wanted them to all know about his um, will and how he had spelled out exactly what he wanted to happen in his will. And then the funny part of working with him and his family, he wanted to plan not only his funeral because he didn't think his family would do it the way he wanted it done. He was very particular how things needed to be done. He knew his family was not going to do it the way he wanted it. So he, while he was alive, he wanted to not only plan his funeral and tell his family he wanted them to follow orders, but he also wanted to plan a life celebration. He said, I want to see all of my family and friends before I die. I don't want just you all seeing them at my funeral after I die. And so even at times we help people as they're dealing with their, their end of life, um, end of life kinds of issues. Um, the psychology of cancer, we find that um, optimism actually is a psychological trait that is beneficial because an optimist getting diagnosed with cancer is more likely to be like, oh, wow, this is serious. This is bad. But I want to be able to do everything that I can to maximize my chances of not only living as long as I can, but maximizing my quality of life. So optimism is good. 
we we've talked um i want to talk about internal locus of control internal locus of control is this sense that i i am in control so an example would be let's say you get a certain grade in your class a person with an internal locus of control who doesn't like that grade would be like whoa that is not the grade i want i'm really going to need um, say for my next exam to study in a different way um, or I ne really need to study more um, that I think if I can do better I can get a better grade internal locus of control. A student with an external locus of control would be like whoa my teacher really hates me and she gave me a bad grade and the reason why I got this bad grade is because she hates me not that I on that exam earned that grade. The one place in life where we see an, an external locus of control to be most beneficial for human beings is when we have an external locus control for a higher power, for God, Allah. Um, and for, even for some people, like a, a sense of connection with the mystical or a sense of connection with nature. That sense of an external locus of control tends to be healthy and tends to be predictive of um, more successful uh, survival with cancer. We talked about um, James Penny Baker back in the social support lecture. He was the one that found that having people write for at least four consecutive days about the same trauma or the same stressful event tends to be beneficial for people's health. And then remember we talked about how uh, early on the writing is very emotional, it's all over the place, it's not linear and that type of thing but usually as the writing goes on it becomes more of a, a story told in a timeline people start integrating their thoughts and emotions and behavior and then people end up uh, using more action verbs uh, later on in the writing because they move to problem solving um, and so that the serenity prayer that old prayer of sort of like um, you know help me understand what i control and let me go do those things that i can control versus what are the things in my life that I absolutely can't control? And if I can't control them, can I try to move myself towards either accepting those things or can I try to move myself more towards allowing those things? We know that writing about the stressful aspects of cancer repetitively, we know that talking about the stressful aspects of cancer repetitively in a social support group, with a hospice group perhaps, with a therapist, that tends to enhance the immune system, improve quality of life, improve pain management, and for some individuals even extend their um, lifespan um, after a cancer diagnosis. So I want to talk a little bit about David Spiegel's research. David Spiegel is a psychiatrist um, out at Stanford University, and he um, did this study many, many moons ago where he took these women with metastatic breast cancer. He, all of them got their medical care as usual, but he randomly assigned them. Half of them just got their medical care as usual. The other half of these women got randomly assigned to where they would attend a support group with other women who also had metastatic breast cancer. And they attended that group, I think for like um, a year and then they, 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 they studied their health over time and then they conducted a follow-up. In his original study, he found that the women randomly assigned to the support group lived on average 36.6 months after diagnosis. The women in the control group just getting medical care as usual, 18.9 months. So his original data, what he found is that the women just attending these medical, these support groups doubled their remaining lifespan. Very, very powerful data. It got a lot of publicity. One of my former um, uh, students, she was ahead of me in graduate school, Kay Sawyer Hermanson, um, after she got her PhD from Virginia Tech, she went out to Stanford and postdoc and she worked with David Spiegel and she herself ran um, quite a few of these support groups and participated um, as a researcher in studying the effectiveness of this type of treatment as well as other treatments. Um, I remember Kay talking about how um, she said she found the halls of Stanford University to be very cutthroat, um, that you were expected to be this warm, fuzzy clinician when you were in the room with people, but outside you were expected to be type A and cutthroat and doing your science and getting your stuff presented and getting your stuff published. I also remember Kay 
um, talking about how, because I'm going to have you watch a, this video clip. It's a pretty lengthy one and it's featuring David Spiegel running one of these support groups um, in a study after his original study. So he's running his own replication study after his original study was published. But keep in mind, these, the, the women that are participating in these support groups, they're in different therapy groups. So he's, he's running a replication group probably because they're filming him for this documentary so he could be on TV. She, she was running support groups, that type of thing. I can tell you, when you watch this, what I want you paying attention to is what is he deliberately doing in these therapy groups that could be beneficial for these women, their mental health, their physical health. So as, as an example, one of the things that he does is he wants these women feeling their emotions, expressing their emotions with one another. Um, and Ramona is my favorite character in this. You see Ramona's kind of stoic um, and she doesn't like to be in touch with her emotions and express her emotions. And over time, Ramona becomes more warm and fuzzy and is able to feel her feelings and express her emotions. Um, and that is a wonderful thing. Okay, now the washer is behind me in the laundry room. So I'm gonna move back out here and see if it's a little bit quieter out here. I'm running away from rain, running away from the sounds of laundry being done today. So I want you to pay attention to what Spiegel is doing in the groups, okay? And that's the kind of stuff I want you to learn. But I wanna tell you that Kay said, that the women in her group, so either, I don't know if the women weren't talking about this in, in a man's uh, led group, or for the sake of the women who, these are real women, real lives with metastatic breast cancer. If they're just protecting their privacy and they didn't, they didn't uh, show this in the, the documentary. But Kay said these women spent a lot more time talking about body image, disfigurement, what it was like having a single mastectomy, what it was like having a double mastectomy. Did they wear prosthesis? Did they go without a prosthetic bra? Um, did they get tattoos? Some women get tattoos after they've um, had that. Some women um, prefer having reconstructive surgery after that. What did these women do? She said there was a lot of discussion, not only about the body image and the disfigurement, but quite a lot of discussion about sexuality. What was it like for them to, um, having lost their breasts, having lost sensation, what was it like for them, for partners to see them, see their scars? Um, what was it like for them if they had their ovaries and uterus removed and go into this very abrupt menopause, which is quite unpleasant sexually? Um, and so all of those kinds of issues, issues of threats in their um, sexual relationships if they had a partner at the time. So Kay said that there was a lot more going on than you might see in this particular documentary. Um, I also want to talk about, there's even some research of using um, psychological support groups um, for people with melanoma. So this is a study published in the 90s where they randomly assign people to a support group or not six weeks after melanoma surgery where they had um, skin removed um, and sometimes small parts of skin removed, sometimes very large uh, parts of skin removed to try to get contain melanoma before it um, travels, metastasizes and kills that person. Keep in mind that when we think of melanoma, we think about people having melanoma on the surface of their skin. The scary thing about melanoma is that people can develop it and it can actually um, replicate inside our bodies and not just necessarily on the, uh, the skin, the outer layer of our skin. They found in this particular study that same kind of thing that David Spiegel originally found that six years later, uh, these melanoma patients had better survival rates if they had attended that support group. Um, but then just like the David Spiegel da data, so I gave you the data for his original study, his replication studies where you're going to be watching one of these groups, it did not replicate. And then there are other researchers who have been on board with this, Andrew Kowski at Kentucky, my, um, my former student, Dr. Kate, Christy Graves, she um, went and postdoc with Andrew Kowski um, after she got her PhD. Um, there are other researchers who have also tried to replicate the breast cancer study results who have not. I can tell you where the cutting edge research is, and this is why I want you paying to, attention to Ramona um, as you watch the documentary. 
the people that benefit the most from a support group are the people who oftentimes in the real world would not go to a support group. Okay. The people who feel like, why would I want to hear other people's sad stories about their cancer? I'm just trying to deal with my cancer. Why would I want to go for people who've been raised like Ramona, who are very stoic, that you need to show your strength, especially your strength, your fighting cancer. Um, there are even scholars that hate that term fighting it. Like, oh, I fight strep throat or, you know, that, like I fight allergies. That's just, it's just sort of silly in that regards people with that warrior kind of language the people feeling like they have to be strong um, and you're going to hear the women in the spiegel documentary one example is uh, one woman says wait for wednesdays and the wait for wednesdays part is these women are out there caretaking they're caretaking in their families and they're not necessarily expressing their fears and their vulnerabilities and their emotions to their family and their friends it's a wait for Wednesday when I get into my group and I can let this stuff out there. So that pressure for a lot of individuals to be strong, to fight it, don't let it get you, um, to not show vulnerable emotions. A lot of times people are afraid of bringing up terminal illness and cancer to somebody who has it because they're afraid it will upset them, which in my mind, it's like, yeah, it's upsetting having the disease. A lot of times people like being asked, they like being able to share these emotions with others instead of feeling very alone with it. Again, almost like wait for Wednesdays if you've got a support group. Um, where the cutting edge research is, is, again, it's those individuals who aren't very in touch with their feelings, aren't very good at sharing it, individuals who do not have the social support, they do not have the family and friends, they do not have the people asking how they're doing, they do not have the people bringing them food when they are down on chemo, as an example, or taking care of their kids or mowing their lawns. The people who don't have that kind of stuff are the people that benefit the most. They get into those groups and, and have an opportunity to open up and it's a safe space to be able to do that kind of stuff. Those are the people that benefit the most. And this almost begs the question after you watch this documentary, are these groups only good for, for women? And the answer is no, that both Dean Ornish running his uh, cardiac rehab groups um, uh, contained of mainly men, although women are in those groups too, or groups for men with testicular cancer, or groups for men with prostate cancer. Um, what a lot of men find is once they get into a group like that, and there's, there's a therapist leading it, and it's a safe place to be able to vent those emotions, guys open up. And in fact, a lot of guys have been holding all that kind of crap in all their lives, trying to be strong. Um, and so having a place where they're allowed to do that, men can vent and express those kinds of things very much like women also. Okay, so pay attention to what Spiegel is doing as he's leading these groups. They're very humanistic. Uh, they're all women. They're in the same situation. They've all had metastatic breast cancer. Um, you'll see that they're sharing their, their educational, they're sharing their information, they're supporting one another in decisions. He's really encouraging free expression of their emotion. He is helping them face the fact that um, that once you have metastatic breast cancer, then most women who have it, and again, men can get it, they know what their cause of death is gonna be. And so that whole idea of like, oh, this is the thing that's gonna take me out, um, and expressing those emotions and not holding them in, that it is harmful for our immune system to hold in and suppress emotions. It's even, it's even harsh on our brain to suppress emotions. We don't even think as clearly. We're not smart if we're, if we're using energy to suppress emotions. So helping them face their treatments, helping them face their death, helping them um, talk about putting their affairs in order, um, you'll see one of the women talking about how she shares with her brother on the phone after she's had a recurrence that average lifespan is two years. And she even talks about how, like, I, you know, it was weird for me to hear myself say it, but I needed him to know that this is likely going to take my life um, sometime in the near future. Oh, I'm tearing up thinking about this. Um, but, but even expressing to her loved ones that I want, um, I want them to know that, that this is the, this is the disease that's likely going to take my life. And um, I would like to talk about it, that type of thing. Um, you'll, again, Kay, Kay um, talked about how a lot of 
discussion is about changing uh, their lives, coping with disability, coping with disfigurement, coping with sexuality, that kind of stuff. And then you will see in these groups just that delivery of unconditional positive regard, that idea that, hey, we are all in this together, this idea that these women are being encouraged to support one another emotionally and in their decisions while they're reaping that support themselves. Um, and so I want you really focusing on that while you watch it. Um, I will give some of you a trigger warning that um, particularly if you've been through this yourself or anybody in your life, there are some scenes that can be kind of rough. Um, if you find yourself really upset by any of these scenes, um, please contact me or post to the discussion forum. Um, and um, on that note, I will encourage you to watch this documentary. Um, and take notes on it as you do. Remember, this is the replication study. He did not find that doubling of remaining lifespan in the, um, in the replication, but we do know that there are some individuals who very much benefit from these support groups, other individuals, not so much. Having said that, hey, people, we are all in this COVID pandemic together. Most of us are now, um, quarantined at home. Um, I am afraid things could get worse before they get better. I really hope all of you out there that your family and your friends and everybody being very careful behaviorally to stay safe. Um, I hope that our lives are not that affected personally by all of this because it does definitely sounds like there are other people across the world and in areas of the U.S. that are being affected. Um, Please feel free to ask questions, make comments on the discussion forum. Please feel free to contact me um, individually. I'd be glad to, um, to reach out over the phone, to Zoom, um, to email you all as we go through this. Um, note that if you're watching this, um, the next step is to take your final exam. The final exam absolutely needs to be completed unless you have extenuating circumstances, and if that's the case, contact me, by Thursday, May 7th um, at a 11 o'clock. You would have 50 minutes at 11 o'clock, so that would be our normal um, exam time. You are welcome to take um, the final exam early and go ahead and complete the course. Um, know that if you complete the course early, I will... Your grades will be those four exam scores on as you learn, you just add them up, they're all out of 25%. And then if you have any extra credit, you would add those um, potential two percentage points on top of your 100% potential from those four exams. I will not be a posting exam grades on Banner until everybody has had their opportunity to do online extra credit and all of that is due on reading day. So my point is your grade, you can total up your grade, sum those up and get your percentage on as you learn, but it's not gonna show up necessarily on Banner until we've all um, finished out the semester after reading day. I miss you all greatly. I would much rather have you in front of me in the classroom. I would much rather be there. I would much rather we all have our normal lives back. Um, so I'm feeling for everyone out there, um, but we are doing the best we can to finish out your education this semester um, and teach you the best that we can, whether it be um, in our homes, remotely, online, or um, since we can't be in the classroom. Take care, everybody. 2020, 2020 has been a rough year. Maybe we'll all get past it and get to 2021. All right, take care. Bye.